Welcome to Bargaining in War. As the title gives away, this is a series of lectures on the intersection between negotiations and the initiation of militarized conflict. What I'm going to be doing in this lecture is providing a broad overview of what we are covering and what we are not covering and why we are doing that. To start off, I want to think about three overarching explanations for war that you might think about. The first is irrational explanations for war. These are situations where a leader is just completely incapable of processing information, and that is resulting in states fighting, whereas if we had replaced that leader with someone who was capable of processing the information, we would not have had a war start. Second explanation for war relies on something known as principal agent problems. These are situations where a leader has some sort of cleavage between him or her and her population. You can think about a situation where a leader might have some sort of diversionary incentive, where things are going very poorly at home, and so the leader might want to distract his or her population from those problems at home by initiating a fight elsewhere. You can also think about situations here where there's some wealth to be gained by fighting a war that only the leader and his or her cronies would enjoy, and so he or she starts the war to obtain those benefits at the cost of his or her population. The third class of explanations is looking at the absence of those two. So we would think about these as rational, unitary actor explanations for war. So these are situations where we're thinking about a leader who is acting in good faith for his or her national interest and is capable of processing information properly. This third class is the type of explanation that we're going to be focusing on in this course. From a couple of different perspectives, you might think that this sort of class of explanations isn't really that much to be thinking about. You might think, for example, because war is costly, because there's just so much expense involved in fighting a war, war is among the costliest and most destructive things mankind ever faces and continues on a regular basis to face, you might think because of those costs, there is no way that two actors acting in good faith on behalf of their countries who are completely rational and capable of processing information would ever get themselves involved in a war. That's one perspective on why this might be trivial. Another perspective on why this might be trivial is that you might think that there are circumstances where it's just not possible for these two types of leaders to reach a settlement. That if they both calculate that the expected payoff for fighting a war is going to be positive, that as a consequence of that, war is beneficial to both parties, and so they fight a war. What we're going to ultimately be seeing in this course is neither of those very trivial looks at rational unitary actor explanations is actually getting it right. We are going to see that because war is costly, there exists in principle mutually preferable settlements such that both sides are happy with the deal that is being imposed and prefer that deal to fighting a war instead. However, we're also going to see various sorts of circumstances where despite the fact that those agreements exist in principle, they can't actually reach those agreements and they end up fighting a war instead. So the majority of the time in this course is going to be trying to unfold that puzzle figure out why it should be the case that parties should always figure out a settlement that leaves them better off, and why, despite the fact that in principle that should be happening, it doesn't actually happen. The reason that we are focusing on this third class of explanations in this course is in part because this is what international relations scholars tend to focus on, at least in much greater depth than irrational or principal agent problem explanations for war. And the reason is actually not crazy. It's not because we have some sort of bias for rational unitary actor explanations. It's because we actually need to cover these sorts of things before we can actually properly address either of the first two points. What do I mean by that? Well, let's think about an irrational explanation for war. How do we define irrationality? Well, irrationality by itself is not a thing. Irrationality is the absence of rationality. It's the negation of rationality. So if we're trying to pin an explanation for war as being irrational, 
we first need to actually work through all of our rational explanations for war and be able to describe why the situation in question is not going to result in a war with a rational actor. And if we then see a war occurring, we can then plausibly ascribe it to irrational explanations. So that's why we are focusing on the rational part of the explanations for war as a starting point and not the irrational explanations. To be clear, I am not saying that wars have never been fought because of irrational issues. I am saying, however, that if we want to be able to demonstrate that, to provide a plausible and strong and persuasive argument that that is the case, we first really need to be doing the rational explanations first. Meanwhile, principal agent problems, it's hard not to avoid those things. It's very clear that in many situations, leaders of countries are facing incentives that are not perfectly aligning with the citizens on the ground. It is straightforward to think that in principle, we should be seeing diversionary explanations for war and maybe having leaders acting in selfish ways to try to acquire a good for themselves at the cost of his or her people. Again, very plausible to think that. However, there are two reasons why we're still focusing on rational unitary actor explanations. The first is that even if we have a leader that has some sort of principal agent cleavage, the rational unitary actor explanations are still going to be floating around at least at some level in those circumstances. So the amount of work that we're doing in searching for rational unitary actor explanations is not being entirely lost once we start thinking about leaders that have those sorts of cleavages. Perhaps the more important reason why we're focusing on rational unitary actor explanations first, however, is that we don't hear those leaders who have those principal agent cleavages saying that they're fighting wars as a consequence of principal agent problems. What we do have leaders saying is that they are fighting wars because it's in the national interest. You will not hear a leader say, oh yes, I am fighting this war to distract you from the scandal that's going on in my country. They're not going to say that. They will say things along the lines of, hey, we're fighting this war because that other country is very bad and we can't trust them. We need to fight a war because it's in our best interest to do so. So if we want to understand whether those sorts of explanations, the explanations that leaders will try to sell to a population, if we want to understand whether those actually have merit, we actually need to study the rational unitary actor explanations. So that's what we're going to be focusing on in this course. And in the next lecture, we'll get to it. We're going to start off in the next lecture by trying to understand why, in principle, there should be these deals that both sides prefer to war. And then once we understand that, once we have a mastery of that, we can start expanding into explanations for why states fight wars despite that. Hope you enjoyed this and hope to see you next time. Take care.